Okay, do me a favor. Can you all clap for a minute? Stop. Now clap again, but synchronize. Stop. So I do this sometimes to, to, to kind of, first I like to be clapped. Like on stage. But, but, but secondly, there's, a, uh, there's a, a, a very interesting, I think, realization that um, you know, people are coming to that large groups can be organized, even self-organize, around achieving specific kinds of goals. So um, largely speaking, crowdsourcing is about um, tapping the intellectual and creative and inventive capacity of the planet and putting that to work on really important kinds of problems. Now, you can crowdsource anything, I suppose. Uh, we tend to focus more in the, the R&D and, and sort of the creative arena. But, you know, I, I think an awful lot of the attention around crowdsourcing uh, is really playing into this area. So just using that as an example, um, if you could take the same kind of energy and tap it on a global scale, you would have the largest pool of creative energy in the history of the world ever to put on certain kinds of problems. Not all problems, but certain kinds of problems. And that's really what we're talking about tapping here today. Uh, the title is Towards New Science for Public Health. No, that's your, the title here is Crowdsourcing to Generate Innovation Capital, Case Studies in New Media Science. I'm gonna talk, um, 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 part of what I was asked to do here was to provide some examples from the work that uh, my company in Incentive has done um, because I know those pretty well. So I'm not a salesperson, um, as you'll learn here pretty quickly. But what I would like to do is share a few of those examples and some of our learnings. And uh, hopefully that will provide, at the very least, some templates or archetypes that, that, that you can have um, that may be helpful as you sort of think about, you know, potentially taking a much broader view of, of, of innovation. So um, let me first introduce you to the company. I already mentioned Incentive as a concatenation of innovation and incentive. The company was founded 11 years ago by Eli Lilly. It's now a standalone company, but it's worth noting to, to, to this audience that when the company was founded, it was founded for a very specific reason. And that was that the cost of pharmaceutical research was um, consistently growing uh, faster than top line revenue. And I think that was true for pharma in general and is probably true in many industries. It gets more and more expensive to do innovation. And certainly in the pharmaceutical industry, that was something that they, they recognized. And so one of the first um, um, uh, initiatives that they undertook, uh, and this was in the year 2001, was could we use technology and distribute some of that R&D process around the world? Would it work? What would incentives need to look like? How would problems need to be structured? Are there, you know, could we tackle the deepest, most complex problems or only sort of, you know, you know uh, light problems? What were the limitations around that? Treated very much as an experiment for the few, first few years. Turns out this process works better than anybody imagined. And it's now a standalone company that does this for, for many different industries. Um, the basic model takes a, takes a well-defined problem, assigns some kind of an inducement mechanism to it, and uses the internet to push out problems all around the world. It's about distributing the problem solving process. Um, today we have about 270,000 engineers, scientists, researchers, you know, school teachers, um, anyone that wants to be involved in a problem solving regimen. They come from 200 countries. We reach almost 12 million through partnerships we have with organizations like The Economist and Nature, social media and so forth. Um, this is a, even though this is an open network, the people that participate in this kind of problem solving um, tend to be quite selective about what they do. And, if, uh, and we, we, we poll our network from time to time. About 61%, that's been a pretty consistent number, about 61% have masters and PhDs. And we've awarded millions of dollars to date solving problems to the network. So this is a very engaged network. Um, you know, quite a bit of funding flows through and solving real problems for, for, for government, for corporations, for not-for-profits. Uh, they do come from all over the world. Um, we see hot spots in areas like Russia, um, Europe. We see areas that we don't operate quite as much in. Um, and typically, I think that's due to, to language. So Brazil should be a little bit more active, but um, you know, you know, English isn't as prevalent there. Um, and we see um, a tremendous amount of participation coming from academia, coming from corporate researchers, and other areas. 
to just sort of give you an example of what it means to participate in a crowdsourced innovation network. If you were a problem solver, you would come to uh, Innocentive and you would, see, um, you would see problems. In effect, think of it like a Google where you could search for the kinds of problems that you want to work on. I've selected here um, um, uh, examples uh, uh, that, that come um, oftentimes from more the medical research arena, but you see here, you know, Cleveland Clinic, implantable microsensors. Um, you see here um, um, uh, particle size distributions after milling, so that's for an industrial application. We create virtual <coughs> spaces, uh, and again, this one's for the Cleveland Clinic, where you can do different kinds of problem solving. Here's our global health pavilion. You see down there, improving the first 20 years of human health. That's a program that was done, um, some of which with funding from organizations in this room. You can see a little bit on the left over there, filters for people that want to work on problems in uh, you know, computer information technology or life sciences or math and statistics. So problem solvers, they select into the network, they register, they look for problems that they could work on, um, and then they, then they participate. These aren't just individual solvers. They're also academic labs. They're also companies. So of those 270,000 solvers, 10% are actually companies. So if you think about that, we have almost 30,000 companies on here. And in some cases, they're actually acting as the front end, looking for research collaborations or looking for a program that they can work on as a company. So you have a lot of sort of individuals and organizations flowing through the system here, getting identified and matched with problems that they can work on. It's worth pointing out that in this model, and it's one of the things that, um, uh, that, that uh, was designed in from the very beginning, if a problem is solved here, the inducement is paid. So what does that mean? That means that the problem's not solved, the inducement's not paid. Which means where you take sort of the traditional model of industrial research, you know, I'm going to, you know, either do the research by hiring people, putting them in the lab in upstate New York, or I'm going to endow a chair at a university and wait five or 10 years, and it's either gonna produce the innovation I'm looking for or it's not. In this model, I'm principally paying for success. So what we've covered now is vast numbers of people participating, so I'm parallelizing a problem, a time compression, these things happen very quickly, and more of a pay for performance model. It's largely those three factors, I think, that, um, that uh, uh, you know, help describe crowdsourcing innovation, at least this style, and why it's very interesting to organizations today. Um, I mentioned we work with groups like Nature, so if you go to Nature and uh, you know, you'll click on Open Innovation on their home page. You'll go to a section that is um, powered by Innocentive. Why is this important? It's important because when we work with organizations in the life sciences, as an example, and they're looking for people to try to solve a problem, we'll actually push this problem out through, in this case, the Nature Network, or Popular Science, or The Economist, or wherever we think there might be solvers to solve those kinds of problems. So if you think about the kinds of organizations we build today, which are exceedingly important, don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing here to replace the existing institutions with an entirely new structure. But if you think about how much, how much value there is around the world that you don't tap today, and how much richer the innovation process is if I can, if I can essentially access on demand huge pools of potential innovators, particularly for problems that may be stuck in the existing system, or we need a breakthrough, or we need an entirely new sort of perspective on how to solve that problem, or you know, you know, you know, uh, apply a technology in a newer, different way. This is a way to get to that. Um, we've found over the last couple of years that this is not, you know, originally there was a question, okay, this is great, so we can use this in pharma. We can use this for problems like identifying new protein synthesis routes, but how far can you take it? And what we have found is there's really no limit. I think this is now sort of a horizontal mechanism. We can use this for technology. We can use this for policy. We can use this for ideation, where we want to put lots of new approaches or novel ideas into the funnel, and we can use it to resolve down to specific solutions that may meet a, sp a particular set of needs. Often when we run programs with The Economist, as an example, what we're doing is we're looking at things there and sort of to benefit the social good or in areas of philanthropy. So different audiences participate in different ways, but the audiences all get involved, self-select into the kinds of problems where they can add value. Um, okay, and then just to give a, a, a very quick kind of sampling, you know, are these, are these sort of crowdsourcing of innovation style approaches taking hold? We think they are. So 
Um, you know, a, a few groups in the room might recognize your, your names here. We've done a, uh, a sampling here of uh, companies in the commercial, not-for-profit uh, not and foundation space. We see a lot of trials going on. We see a lot of organizations trying to understand whether these kinds of technologies and approaches can work in their, uh, in their environment. And there are many companies that are actually quite far along in this journey as well. Um, so if you go all the way back to a company like Procter & Gamble, they made a commitment a decade ago to, to get more and more of their innovation from the outside and bring it into the organization. And then there are new organizations that are really just trying to understand how to use this, in some cases because they just want to innovate better, in other cases because um, of the, uh, the increasing cost of innovation and the need to have more cost-effective innovation routes. Um, so really at the base of all of this is a, is a fundamental question. Where do you think knowledge lives today? And our view is that knowledge lives everywhere. It lives in businesses. It, so it lives among who we would typically call experts. It's at universities. A lot of these are sort of the traditional sources, although many organizations are only doing sort of, you know, they're able to, to tap individuals or groups. It's more of a point-to-point -point kind of a collaboration. But it's in libraries and users and enthusiasts. Here, a lot of you are familiar with the notion of kind of prosumers and consumers. I mean, the, the, the individuals and the groups that can sort of benefit and contribute to the innovation process is vast. And most organizations don't have any effective way of tapping that today. These new kinds of tools and methods are really all about tapping that. I put in the right here retirees, amateurs, foundations, communities. And I specifically chose a couple of examples here in a few minutes to illustrate the incredible ability of innovations to come from areas that you would not typically uh, have guessed up front they could come from. And that's what we're trying to tap. A couple of definitions. So first, let's start with what do we think innovation is? An, an event characterized by an act of creation or invention followed by a successful implementation. I tend to gravitate towards definitions that talk about output, sort of tangible value creating output. Pick your own definition. Um, we're actually in a space that we call open innovation. So crowdsourcing is the popular term, even though I don't think it emerged until probably 2006 or 2007. But open innovation is sort of the field we're in. That is how do we take an industrial process like innovation and open it up in a systematic, predictable way that drives unbelievable value. So in this context, it's the premise that companies or organizations should make greater, greater use of external ideas and technologies, and quite conversely, also share technologies and capabilities they have more freely with the rest of the world. So what this does is it sort of challenges to some degree the way organizations engage today. Now I know perfectly well when we're talking about NIH grants and NSF grants and all the kinds of things we do here, that there's a funding mechanism that's pretty constant and there is a sharing of information. I'm not discounting that, but largely the innovation process as we know it is about taking a funnel of ideas Oftentimes there will be a stage gate process or something else that says not likely to succeed, not likely to succeed, and we get things out to market. In the open innovation realm, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's broader than that. It says the ideas can come from anywhere. They can come from, from customers, they come from marketing, they come from you know, a research agenda, and that we've got ideas and approaches coming into the funnel all the time and going out of the funnel. We're still only going to take certain things to market. But you'll notice sort of the dotted lines. This is to illustrate the notion that we now are talking about more porous boundaries. In a lot of ways, this challenges the organization as we think about it today. So to really, I think, get the, 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 the kind of the core um, idea down pat, um, here's an example that, uh, or, or an illustration that I usually provide. And we call it the long tail of innovation. So you're all familiar with the notion of the long tail, Chris Anderson, do you remember that? So what Chris Anderson said was, he was trying to explain why an Amazon had to beat out bricks and mortar bookstores. And he had a brilliant way to sort of describe it in a way that people got. What he said is if you go into a bricks and mortar bookstore, the books that you see on the shelf are the best sellers. Why? Because as a small bricks and mortar bookstore, typically that's all they can afford to stock. So it's got the best likelihood of, produce, of maximizing revenue for that, that, that store. Um, now, we've got Barnes and Nobles and other mega stores, but you know, we're, we're, we're really talking about the bricks and mortar stores and the mom and pop stores. And what he said is, look, here's the reality. The vast majority of books sold in any single day are they're not bestsellers, not even close. That long tail is extensive. The thing is a bricks and mortar bookstore can't afford to stock every one of those books. So they go for the few 
that are probably going to maximize revenue in that day. And Amazon, that can stack all of the books, can capture the lion's share of the demand on any day, which gives them vastly superior economics. Why does the analogy work? Our organizations were typically stocking with skill sets that we think are the most appropriate, given the resources we have, for the kinds of problems we want to solve. That's the left side over here. I'm calling that sort of traditional problem solvers. We want to solve a problem in chemistry? I don't know. Maybe we stock the company with PhDs in chemistry from Stanford, and, or pick your favorite school. That's what we do. And if we decide we've got more chemistry problems to solve, or those problems aren't getting solved, we must not have enough in the way of resources, we go get more that look and act exactly the same way. I think as you move right on the long tail here, you've now got sort of an adjacency here. What about all of the problem solvers that might be in nearby fields with different perspectives that could work on that same kind of a problem? Or go even further out and find very non-traditional problem solvers that may have entirely unique approaches. So the idea here is how much of this long tail of innovation can I bring to bear? So when I'm looking at crowdsourcing, what I'm doing is I'm tapping the long tail of innovation. Now those are individuals, those are companies, uh, from different fields. It's the entire world of potential creative and inventive capacity, but that's what I'm trying to tap, where most organizations today are really looking very much at this, right? And even if they go to another organization to help them with research, often what they're doing is they're taking the work off of their books and moving it on to somebody else's, which is really just a form of, of, uh, of, of outsourcing. Here we're trying to get to brand new talent in very different ways in economically um, intriguing ways. Okay, so let's ask the question, where does innovation happen? This has been touched on a couple of times here today already. Harvard uh, Business School did a, uh, a pretty famous study on Innocent of a couple of years ago. And what they were trying to understand, because we've done sort of more of this style of problem solving than anyone, they were trying to understand whether they could draw any conclusions from where solutions were happening. And so they looked over the course of, I don't know, hundreds of problems solved across the network. Now you saw a few examples of those, right? These, these are problems that run the gamut from, you know, new and intriguing ways to verify nuclear stockpiles to I need a chemical that looks like this and has the following set of properties that I can use in this kind of materials application, whatever. And so they went out and they looked at the problems and they said, where do we think that problem should be solved? And what was the background of the individual or the organization that ultimately solved the problem? That's what they wanted to understand. And so what was found was, and, and this is where they created a tree. So I asked the graphics guys to, to give me an upside down tree here. That's, that's a tree, right? And way out at the ends of the tree here are sort of discrete fields. So maybe this is, you know, electrochemistry. This is chemistry and this is electrochemistry. And each of these are fields that sort of get broken to lower and lower areas. And they said, okay, where do we think a problem's going to be solved? So this is a problem in protein synthesis. So we think it's gonna be solved by a protein synthesis expert. And where did it get solved? It got solved over here. Well, on average, these problems were solved no less than six nodes away, right? So in a lot of ways, what this was illustrating was the notion that if it could have been solved by the experts in that field already, it would have been solved by the experts in that field. Now it's time to move on to those adjacent fields and those things sort of, you know, down that long tail that we just talked about. And in fact, what we found was, what, what Harvard found was, chemistry problems were being solved by biologists, right? Uh, you know, problems in, in uh, mathematics were being solved by computer scientists. And it really created a lot of what we now have as the, the more intellectual framework behind the notion that diversity matters and that we need to enrich our R&D and innovation processes rapidly to take advantage of these realities. Um, to do this is where incentives based model comes in. So we use this notion of a challenge. Now with the America Competes Act and the uh, authority that they get, that gave government agencies to do prizes and so forth, that's a manifestation of this. But this thing called a challenge has a very special role in the world. And its role in the world is to define a problem so succinctly, so well, that I can distribute that unit of work only here, instead of the piece of work being a manufacturing, uh, you know, a purchase order to manufacture something, it's creative and inventive work. And so that thing called a challenge is incredibly important. It also turns out that the sort of the competitive psychology of this thing called a challenge is important as well. You're dealing now with networks. These are not employees. These are not companies that may be contracted with you today. Right? So as a consequence of that, this idea that we can put them in competition, that we can put them in, 
sort of, sort of an arena where that energy flows is incredibly important. So, you know, we chose this picture very deliberately. The notion that a challenge evokes sort of this kind of a behavioral psychology was important. Well, it turns out that these challenges um, um, go much deeper than even this. So, you know, I think kind of famously, um, Albert Einstein said if he had 60 minutes to save the world, he'd spend 55 minutes asking the right questions, right? You need to understand what it is you want to do. And so this challenge framing is an incredibly important aspect of this. And I'm going to put it out there just because I think it's an important learning for all organizations, whether you're going to use open innovation or crowdsourcing innovation or not, understanding the problems that you're trying to solve, what strategic levers they tie to, what are the market failures that explain why we don't have solutions today, what has worked and not worked, how does the IP need to work, all of these things are exceedingly important. If you don't know this, you can't put the piece of work out there to be done. And so where a lot of organizations fail today is it turns out they don't have a terribly good articulation of even what their problems are. So interestingly enough, one of the things that organizations have consistently told us the last couple of years is that one of the most valuable parts of engaging in open innovation is they're now building skills that they can use inside and out to better understand, prioritize, and document their problems. Once they do that, oftentimes they're able to distribute them inside or outside better than they could before. But this is sort of a key enabler. Um, it turns out that there's actually a whole structure that has now evolved around this. So this is just our vernacular, but you may have your own. You know, certain kinds of problems are to get ideas, right? We're looking for new and novel approaches. Some are just to find, um, you know, new theoretical approaches to be evaluated, costed. Sometimes you want to create a prototype or a new approach. Prove it to me. Give me a data set that shows me that works. And in some cases, you're just looking for a collaboration partner. We've actually created these and a whole, and a whole subset of these in areas from data analytics um, to sort of, you know, new molecule competitions that all meets different kinds of needs. I'm sharing this slide to basically say this is a much more developed area than you may realize. And I think in your applications, you may be able, you may be already be using aspects of this, or you may need to develop it, or we can share at least what we've learned. But these kinds of tools are very powerful. Without the problem formulation, without the understanding of how the systems work, and without a little bit of discipline around how these, how these tools are used, you probably won't be as successful. However, if you apply these kinds of principles, you can effectively tap that sort of worldwide, um, worldwide capacity that we talked about earlier. Um, I wanted to give just a little bit more of an example of the kinds of problems that we're talking about here. These are routinely done in the crowdsourcing world today in the innovation realm. Seeking elastic materials, IP strategies in the area of chemistry, high-speed tree injection, improving material handling efficiency, sensor system design, novel electronic air impellers. There is really not a, not a big limitation to what you can do. I will say certain kinds of problems are probably more difficult to do through these systems if they require enormous capital uh, to, essentially, to essentially participate in the process. Um, if the knowledge sets are knowledge sets that you can't readily share with the rest of the world, then you're not going to be able to tool the solvers or the external companies to participate. Um, a, lot, a lot there that we're happy to share. Wanted to give you um, a couple of examples of this in the real world, including, um, including one from government. But let me start first here with uh, the Price for Life Foundation. Some of you may know this group. So this is an example in um, essentially medical research. Price for Life Foundation is a Boston-based foundation. They're focused on ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease research. One of the biggest um, um, uh, hindrances to research there over the last several years has been an effective biomarker. Now I realize there are people in this room that understand this much better than I do, so forgive me. But we ran a program over the course of multiple years, starting with new and novel approaches to biomarker creation, culminating with a new biomarker for Lou Gehrig's disease research. Total program, it shows here a million dollars went to the winner. Total program was about 1.2 million when we were done. But the, appro the, the final solution to this was a non-invasive biomarker for neuro neurodegenerative disorders. Think about a chair where essentially I can measure electrical activity across the skin non-invasive. Uh, this was actually being developed for slightly different applications. This approach focused that energy over the course of a couple of years. Solutions came from all kinds of different areas. Statistical analysis kinds of uh, solutions coming from you know, biostatisticians to different types. But it turns out this one went to uh, Dr. Rutkov and some of his um, colleagues at Beth Israel Hospital for this sort of non-invasive approach. 
It's estimated that that same biomarker would have cost almost $100 million to develop on the outside. And there were teams competing to do this. So you can kind of see how this is really playing into, in a much deeper way, the kinds of problems that we assumed couldn't be tackled this way. And the second example is um, the Oil Spill Recovery Institute. So um, uh, the Oil Spill Recovery Institute was, was launched after the Exxon Valdez spill. Everybody remember that? Turns out 80, 90,000 barrels of oil still sitting on the bottom of Prince William Sound. Anybody know what the real issue was there and why that was so different? It's because it was subarctic waters. So, you know, a lot of the oil spills that we think about happen in warmer places around the world. Here, it's exceedingly cold. So what happens to something really viscous like oil when it drops below freezing? Well, it's, it acts like a solid. So the problem is they didn't have any easy and efficient way to pump the oil up through the barge system onto the onshore collection systems that it would just bind up the systems. So um, after about 17 years, uh, we collaborated with the Oil Spill Recovery Institute to put a challenge on the network and said, said, can you solve this problem? Now we did a couple of things here that were, were important. The first thing we did that was important is it didn't say anything in the challenge about oil spill recovery. Anybody know why? We knew that if we said oil spill recovery or oil, we would attract solvers that were from that area and we would not get solvers from adjacent areas. One of the big learnings we've had is you, you sort of decontextualize the problem to a great degree. So we said, how do you break viscous shear? Well, a construction engineer from the Midwest, um, who basically noted that concrete is solid, it wants to say solid, but you're going to pour it in a liquid form and you need to keep it liquid long enough that you can sort of set the foundation. So imagine little sort of, you know, pipes or rods going into the cement vibrating very quickly, keeping it, you know, adding enough energy that it keeps it pourable until I'm ready. And so the solution was an off the shelf you know, off-the-shelf equipment from the construction industry with a slight set of modifications that could be used for this application. So this is Scott Pegau. He's the director of the um, Oil Spill Recovery Institute. And we fund research and demonstration projects related to oil spill recovery in Arctic and subarctic water. Within the oil, oil spill response industry, there's you know, a limited number of people. Uh, if it was easily solved by the people within the industry, it would have been solved by the people within the industry. And the incentive process allows us to step outside the box and, and look at more creative solutions um, that, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you slap your head and go, well, why didn't I think of that? And it's glad that we asked someone else. So the uh, last example I want to give here is one that relates to uh, uh, NASA. This, this, this has been a pretty uh, fruitful partnership between Incentive and NASA over the last couple of years. This particular one is around forecasting of solar flares. Um, and uh, this one's about two years old. It was announced by um, uh, Anish Chopra at, uh, 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 I guess, last year at the, uh, here in D.C. But I'll let Anish tell the story here. These policy environments uh, also have led to a very interesting observation. And that interesting observation has been something the president called for in his memo on that first full day. A notion that in our society, knowledge is widely dispersed. And if knowledge is widely dispersed, how do we capture the insights from the American people? In traditional environments, it's difficult. But with the use of today's technologies, the crowdsourcing platforms and others, we can find that needle in the haystack and bring those ideas to fruition. I share with you the results just for the first time today released. NASA's early experience with the Innocentive Scientific Expert Network platform, a platform of roughly 200,000 scientists, where NASA said earlier this year, we're going to pose a few difficult scientific challenges, one of which was how do we forecast solar activity so we can better predict when and how we should uh, release our rockets into space. This particular uh, vexing uh, scientific challenge was one that had been grappling the scientists in NASA and its contractors for quite some time. Well, by putting out this challenge in this Innocentive platform, wouldn't you know it, as expected, a semi-retired radio frequency engineer living in rural New Hampshire, a town called Lempster, literally with just an internet connection, was able to share his idea 
on how to address this problem. It had so blown away the others whose ideas were under consideration, NASA reported that this had exceeded their requirements. No complicated RFP, the need for a lobbyist, some convoluted process, just a smart person in our country who could help solve a difficult scientific challenge and was paid a modest $30,000 for that insight. Two, two things really quick I think that's, that's important here. One is you can see from a, looking at this through a procurement lens, this is very powerful. This is why I think there's, this is one of the reasons why I think there's been such interest in prizes and the prize authority. But looking at this through a purely procurement lens, this is an effective market mechanism to drive innovation in addition to being um, um, an enormously intriguing way to sort of access new pools of innovation talent. Second thing is that retired researcher from New Hampshire and that construction engineer from the Midwest, think about where they would have been on that long tail. Would you ever have a, even thought to go to those sources for those kinds of solutions in sort of the traditional way that we think about monolithic R&D today? Um, okay, just uh, two things very quickly. Uh, this one I think is interesting. Time compression. So this is work that was done with Roche, um, kind of studied by and documented by uh, um, the London Business School and M Lab, which is Gary Hamill's group. And the thing that I think was really interesting here is they took a problem they had been working on for 15 years, and they ran it through this kind of a process as a way to sort of test the notions that we can use crowdsourcing um, to our advantage. And what's really interesting thing I think down here at the bottom is his quote. He said, "I could put 10 people in a room." and have a brainstorming session or a seminar for two days for the same cost with all the, uh, for the same cost with all the travel involved, uh, I couldn't. And I would have got a few hundred sticky notes rather than an entire notebook with 113 separate detailed proposals. It turns out, the thing that they were most interested in here is they said that over the course of the, um, I believe this one ran for 90 days, they said that they got essentially a replay of all the work they had done over 15 years. So think about this like constructing IP estate in real time. I want to know what all the world's doing in an area. Maybe they've solved the same problems I'm working on. This also creates an intriguing mode where you can essentially compress those timelines. Lots of solutions very quickly, probably replicating an awful lot of the work that you're doing today or are about to do. This gives you an effective way to do that. And the second example, I know we've got Syngenta here in the room, um, is uh, we've had a great collaboration with Syngenta the last couple of years. Uh, in this case, Forrester Research, if you know them as the research firm, there's been so little ROI analysis done that um, it was, became pretty clear that, that somebody had to look at whether these kinds of open innovation tools can drive real ROI. In this particular case, um, uh, they studied the approach just looking at cost avoidance as an example. And again, in the government arena, I think we're really looking at kind of more cost pressures. And what was found here, this was their calculation, was that the ROI was about 182% using these systems with payback in less than a couple of months. So again, this, this can create a very compelling sort of procurement vehicle for new kinds of innovation. Um, I'm just about done. I wanna share that I think that I'm, I, I am showing you a style of innovation that's all about sort of getting to groups and individuals all over the world. But this is actually part of what I think is a, man, a new management system around innovation. I think we need to look at the innovation process structurally as a whole set of channels, traditional research, contract research, in and out licensing, technology scouting, am I tapping my employees effectively, my users, open innovation markets like incentive, venture partnering, uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier. This is actually a system where I think you can manage that system to drive yield. What I'm really talking about here is in some ways a new operating system for the way that we think about the innovation process where the conventional way that we do innovation today largely, particularly in the corporate world, is but one of many channels. But to do that, to do that, you have to actually have a pretty good picture of what kinds of things I can do in different applications. So I share this slide to basically say, if you take those channels and you look at different kinds of problems, you'll see that certain kinds of problems absolutely <coughs> should be going to employees. If I've got trade secrets that cannot be disclosed to the outside world, I may go to employees or you know, you know, a trusted contract partner. But there may be other kinds of, of, of problems where quite frankly, I need novelty, we don't have an approach. Um, you know, historical channel performance or existing channels has been bad, I need something new, and I'm willing to take some risk reward. So maybe I go to OI markets. 
And there will be other kinds of things where I want to go to a contract research firm because I'm really looking at fees. I don't need diversity. I just need somebody to do a piece of work. This is all really to illustrate that there are very predictable, structured ways to do this. We can create a new operating system for innovation that's more collaborative, more distributed. Uh, the benefits, I think, here are pretty straightforward. Um, um, I doubt anybody would sort of argue with these. But if we can get the various pieces of this right, industrialized, built into a management science, then I think, we can, I think in a lot of ways we can, com we can not only compress some of the innovation, but I think we can fundamentally change uh, the yield rates of how this works. My sense is we can change GDP if we do this right. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I think the, I think the stakes are high. Um, I wanted to share two more things. Um, this is not to give uh, me or my co-author any kudos here, uh, but it is to say that culture change is one of the most difficult aspects of this. And so we wrote a book on this, and chapter eight of the book is really focused, it's a playbook. Somebody used the word playbook earlier. It's a playbook on really how organizations can take on this kind of change. Chapter eight specifically is really looking at this typically through sort of an enterprise business lens. The principles are the same. I'm bringing this up because we made arrangements with the Financial Times Press, the publisher, to make that chapter eight available to groups like this, free of charge. So if anybody wants chapter eight, shoot me a note and I'll, I'll shoot you a PDF of that chapter. Um, and then secondly, um, I got one more thing off of my, my uh, bucket list, which is getting published in, in, in HBR, but I did an article um, September, what is that, two months ago, on are you solving the right problem? And I wanted to include this because we made the same arrangements with HBR. Um, I can send you a reprint for free. So if anybody wants a reprint of this, I'm happy to send it to you. But the point of this is organizations not really being able to articulate problems the right way, applying the right amount of rigor, and if you can't do that, Trust me, you can't do open innovation well. And, and ex the case study that I used for this is actually in the not-for-profit world, but it's about creating uh, cl uh, clean water storage solutions for the developing world. And so I think there are probably a few groups in the room that might actually, um, at the very least, get some, uh, get some value out of the case study. So uh, that's really it. This is my favorite picture right here, the, uh, the turtle with the rocket on its back. But I hope that's been helpful. And I probably overused my time, but I'm happy to take any questions.